AIDS from Wikipedia. For other uses, see AIDS disambiguation. Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome or Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome, AIDS, a spelled A-I-D-S, is a disease of the human immune system caused by the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV. The illness interferes with the immune system, making people with AIDS much more likely to get infections, including opportunistic infections and tumors that do not affect people with working immune systems. This susceptibility gets worse as the disease continues. HIV is transmitted in many ways, such as anal, vaginal, or oral sex, blood transfusion, contaminated hypodermic needles, exchange between mother and baby during pregnancy, childbirth, and breastfeeding. It can be transmitted by any contact of a mucous membrane or the bloodstream with a bodily fluid that has the virus in it, such as the blood, semen, vaginal fluid, presonal fluid, or breast milk from an infected person. The, the virus and disease are often referred together as HIV AIDS. The disease is a major health problem in many parts of the world and is considered a pandemic, a disease outbreak that is not only present over a large area, but is actively spreading. In 2009, the World Health Organization, WHO, estimated that there are 33.4 million people worldwide living with HIV AIDS with 2.7 million new HIV infections per year, and 2.0 million annual deaths due to AIDS. In 2007, UNAIDS estimated 33.2 million people worldwide had AIDS that year. AIDS killed 2.1 million people in the course of that year, including 330,000 children, and 76% of those deaths occurred in Sub-Saharan Africa. According to UNAIDS 2009 report, worldwide some 60 million people have been affected since the start of the pandemic, with some 25 million deaths and 14 million orphaned children in southern Africa alone. Genetic research indicates that HIV originated in West Central Africa during the late 19th or early 20th century. AIDS was first recognized by the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in 1981 and its cause, HIV, identified in the early 1980s. Although treatments for HIV AIDS can slow the course of the disease, there is no known cure or vaccine. Antiretroviral treatment reduces both the deaths and new infections from HIV AIDS, but these drugs are expensive and the medications are not available in all countries. Due to the difficulty in treating HIV infection, preventing infection is a key aim in controlling the AIDS pandemic. With health organizations promoting safe sex and needle exchange programs in attempts to slow the spread of the virus. Signs and symptoms. The symptoms of AIDS are primarily the result of conditions that do not normally develop in individuals with healthy immune systems. Most of these conditions are infections caused by bacteria, viruses, fungi, and parasites that are normally controlled by the elements of the immune system that HIV damages. Opportunistic infections are common in people with AIDS. These infections affect nearly every organ system. People with AIDS also have an increased risk of developing various cancers such as Kaposi's sarcoma, cervical cancer, and cancers of the immune system known as lymphomas. Additionally, people with AIDS often have systematic symptoms of infection, like fevers, sweats, particularly at night, swollen glands, chills, weakness, and weight loss. The specific opportunistic infections that AIDS patients develop depend in part on the prevalence of these infections in the geographic area in which the patient lives. Pulmonary Pneumocystis pneumonia, also known as Pneumocystis carney pneumonia, and still abbreviated as PCP, is relatively rare in healthy, immunocompetent people, but common among HIV-infected individuals. It is caused by Pneumocystis gyrovechi. Before the advent of effective diagnosis, treatment, and routine prophylaxis in Western countries, it was a common, immediate cause of death. In developing countries, it is still one of the first indications of AIDS in untested individuals. Although it does not generally occur unless the CD4 count is less than 200 cells per milliliter of blood. 
Tuberculosis, TB, is unique among infections associated with HIV because it's transmissible to immunocompetent people via the respiratory route and is not easily treatable once identified. Multidrug resistance is a serious problem. Tuberculosis with HIV co-infection, TB HIV, is a major world health problem according to the World Health Organization. In 2007, 456,000 deaths among incident TB cases were HIV positive, a third of all TB deaths and a nearly a quarter of the estimated 2 million HIV deaths in that year. Even though its incidence has declined because of the use of directly observed therapy and other improved practices in Western countries, this is not the case in developing countries where HIV is most prevalent. In early stage HIV infection, CD4 count, greater than 300 cells per milliliter, TB typically presents as a pulmonary disease. In advanced HIV infection, TB often presents atypically with extrapulmonary systemic disease, a common feature. Symptoms are usually constitutional and are not localized to one particular site, often affecting bone marrow, bone, urinary and gastrointestinal tracts, liver, regional lymph nodes, and the central nervous system. Gastrointestinal. Esophagitis is an inflammation of the lining of the lower end of the esophagus, gullets or swallowing tube leading to the stomach. In HIV-infected individuals, this is normally due to fungal candidiasis or viral herpes simplex 1 or cytomegalovirus infections. In rare cases, it could be due to mycobacteria. Unexplained chronic diarrhea in HIV infections is due to many possible causes, including common bacterial salmonella, shigella, listeria, or campylobacter, and parasitic infections and uncommon opportunistic infections such as cryptodysporiasis, microsporidiosis, microbacterium avium complex, and viruses, astrovirus, adenovirus, rotavirus, and cytomegalovirus, the latter as a course of colitis. In some cases, diarrhea may be a side effect of several drugs used to treat HIV, or it may simply accompany HIV infection particularly during primary HIV infection. It may also be a side effect of antibiotics used to treat bacterial causes of diarrhea, common for Clostridium difficile. In the later stages of HIV infection, diarrhea is thought to be a reflection of changes in the way the intestinal tract absorbs nutrients and may be an important component of HIV-related wasting. Neurological and Psychiatric HIV infection may lead to a variety of neuropsychiatric squalae, either by infection of the now susceptible nervous system by organisms or as a direct consequence of the illness itself. Toxoplasmosis is a disease caused by the single-celled parasite called Toxoplasma gandhi. It usually infects the brain, causing toxoplasmus encephalitis, but it can also infect and cause disease in the eyes and lungs. Cryptococcal meningitis is an infection of the menix the membrane covering the brain and spinal cord by the fungus Cryptococcus neoformans. It can cause fevers, headache, fatigue, nausea, and vomiting. Patients may also develop seizures and confusion. Left untreated, it can be lethal. Progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy, PML, is a demyelinating disease in which the gradual destruction of the myelin sheath covering the axons of the nerve cells impairs the transmission of nerve impulses. It is caused by a virus called JC virus, which occurs in 70% of the population in latent form, causing disease only when the immune system has been severely weakened, as is the case for AIDS patients. It progresses rapidly, usually causing death within months of diagnosis. AIDS dementia complex, ADC, is a metabolic encephalopathy induced by HIV infection and fueled by immune activation of HIV-infected brain macrophages and microgilia. These cells are productively infected by HIV and secrete neurotoxins of both host and viral origin. Specific neurological impairments are manifested by cognitive, behavioral, and motor abnormalities that occur after years of HIV infection and are associated with low CD4 plus T cell levels and high plasma viral loads. Prevalence is 10 to 20% in Western countries, 
but only 1 to 2 percent of HIV infections in India. The difference is possibly due to the HIV subtype in India. AIDS-related mania is sometimes seen in patients with advanced HIV illness. It presents with more irritability and cognitive impairment and less euphoria than a manic episode associated with true bipolar disorder. Unlike the latter condition, it may have a more chronic cause. This syndrome is less often seen with the advent of multi-drug therapy. Tumors. Patients with HIV infection have substantially increased incidence of several cancers. This is primarily due to co-infection with onocygenic DNA virus, especially Epstein-Barr virus, EBV, Kaposi sarcoma-associated herpes virus, KSHV, also known as human herpes virus 8, HHV8, and human papillomavirus, HPV. Kaposi sarcoma, as seen in the picture on the left, is the most common tumor in HIV-infected patients. The common appearance of this tumor in young homosexual men in 1981 was one of the first signals of the AIDS epidemic, caused by a gamma herpes virus called Kaposi sarcoma-associated herpes virus, KSHV, it often appears as a purplish nodules on the skin, but can affect other organs, especially the mouth, gastrointestinal tract, and lungs. High-grade B-cell lymphomas, such as Burkitt's lymphoma, Burkitt's-like lymphoma, diffuse large B-cell lymphoma, DLBCL, and primary central nervous system lymphoma, present more often in HIV-infected patients. These particular cancers often foreshadow a poor prognosis. Epstein-Barr virus, EBV, or KSHV, cause many of these lymphomas. In HIV-infected patients, lymphoma often arises in extranodal sites such as the gastrointestinal tract. When they occur in HIV-infected patients, KS and aggressive B-cell lymphomas confer a diagnosis of AIDS. Invasive cervical cancer in HIV-infected women is also considered AIDS-defining. It is caused by human papillomavirus, HPV. In addition to the AIDS-defining tumors listed above, HIV-infected patients are at increased risk of certain other tumors, notably Hodgkin's disease, anal and rectal carcinomas, hepatocellular carcinomas, head and neck cancers, and lung cancer. Some of these are caused by viruses, such as Hodgkin's disease, EBV, anal rectal cancers, HPV, head and neck cancers, HPV, and hepatocellular carcinoma, hepatitis B or C. Other contributing factors include exposure to carcinogens, cigarette smoke for lung cancer, or living for years with subtle immune defects. Interestingly, the coincidence of many common tumors, such as breast cancer or colon cancer, does not increase in HIV-infected patients. In areas where HART is extensively used to treat AIDS, the coincidence of many AIDS-related malignancies has decreased, but at the same time, malignant cancers overall have become the most common cause of death of HIV-infected patients. In recent years, an increasing proportion of these deaths have been from non-AIDS-defining cancers. Other infections. AIDS patients often develop opportunistic infections that present with nonspecific symptoms, especially low-grade fevers and weight loss. These include opportunistic infections with Mycobacterium avium intracellulare and cytomegalovirus, CMV. CMV can cause colitis, as described above, and CMV, retinitis, can cause blindness. Penicillosis, due to penicillin marniathi, is now the third most common opportunistic infection, after extrapulmonary tuberculosis and cryptococcosis in HIV-positive individuals with the endemic area of Southeast Asia. An infection that often goes unrecognized in AIDS patients is parovirus B19. Its main consequence is anemia, which is difficult to distinguish from the effects of antiretroviral drugs used to treat AIDS itself. Section 2. Cause. AIDS is the ultimate clinical consequence of infection with HIV. HIV is a retrovirus that primarily infects vital organs of the human immune system such as CD4 plus T cells, a subset of T cells, macrophages, and dendritic cells. 
It directly and indirectly destroys CD4 plus T cells. Once the number of CD4 plus T cells per microliter of blood drops below 200, cellular immunity is lost. Acute HIV infection usually progresses over time to clinical latent HIV infection, and then to early symptomatic HIV infection, and later to AIDS, which is identified either on the basis of the amount of CD4 plus T cells remaining in the blood and or the presence of certain infections, as noted above. In the absence of antiretroviral therapy, the median time of progression from HIV infection to AIDS is 9 to 10 years, and the median survival time after developing AIDS is only 9.2 months. However, the rate of clinical disease progression varies widely between individuals, from 2 weeks up to 20 years. Many factors affect the rate of progression. These include factors that influence the body's ability to defend against HIV, such as the infected person's general immune function. Older people have weaker immune systems and therefore have a greater risk of rapid disease progression than young people. Poor access to healthcare and the existence of coexisting infections, such as tuberculosis, also may predispose people to faster disease progression. The infected person's genetic inheritance plays an important role and some people are resistant to certain strains of HIV. An example of this is people with the homozygous CCR5-Delta32 variation are resistant to infection with certain strains of HIV. HIV is genetically variable and exists as different strains, which cause different rates of clinical disease progression. There are a number of HIV and AIDS misconceptions. Three of the most common are that AIDS can be spread through casual contact, that sexual intercourse with a virgin will cure AIDS, and that HIV can infect only homosexual men and drug users. Other misconceptions are that any act of anal intercourse between gay men can lead to AIDS infection and that open discussion of homosexuality in HIV in schools will lead to increased rates of homosexuality in AIDS. Section 2.1 Sexual Transmission Sexual transmission occurs with the contact between sexual secretions of one person with the rectal, genital or oral mucous membranes of another. Unprotected sexual acts are riskier for the receptive partner than for the insertive partner and the risk for transmitting HIV through unprotected anal intercourse is greater than the risk from vaginal intercourse or oral sex. However, oral sex is not entirely safe, as HIV can be transmitted through both insertive and receptive oral sex. Sexual assault greatly increases the risk of HIV transmission, as condoms are rarely employed and physical trauma to the vagina or rectum occurs frequently facilitating the transmission of HIV. Drug use has been studied as a possible predictor of HIV transmission. Perry and Hawkettis found that methamphetamine usage does significantly relate to unprotected sexual behavior. The study found methamphetamine users to be at a higher risk for contracting HIV. Other sexually transmitted infections, STI, increase the risk of HIV transmission and infection because they cause the disruption of the normal epithelial barrier by general ulceration and or microulceration, and by accumulation of pools of HIV susceptible or HIV infected cells, lymphosomites and macrophages, in semen and vaginal secretions. Epidemiological studies from Sub-Saharan Africa, Europe and North America suggest that genital ulcers, such as those caused by syphilis and or cancroid, increase the risk of becoming infected with HIV by about fourfold. There is also significant, although lesser, increase in risk from STIs, such as gonorrhea, chlamydia, and trichomoniasis, which all cause local accumulations of lymphocytes and macrophages. Transmission of HIV depends on the infectiousness of the index case and the susceptibility of the uninfected partner. 
infectivity seems to vary during the course of illness and is not constant between individuals. An undetectable plasma viral load does not necessarily indicate a low viral load in the seminal liquid or genital secretions. However, each tenfold increase in the level of HIV in the blood is associated with an 81% increase rate of HIV transmission. Women are more susceptible to HIV-1 infection due to hormonal changes, vaginal microbial ecology, and physiology, and a higher prevalence of sexually transmitted diseases. People who have been infected with one strain of HIV can still be infected later on in their lives by other, more virulent strains. Infection is unlikely in a single encounter. High rates of infection have been linked to a pattern of overlapping long-term sexual relationships. This allows the virus to quickly spread to multiple partners who in turn infect their partners. A pattern of serial monogamy or occasional casual encounters is associated with lower rates of infection. HIV spreads readily through heterosexual sex in Africa, but less so elsewhere. One possibility being researched is that schistosomiasis, which affects up to 50% of women in parts of Africa, damages the lining of the vagina. Section 2.2 Blood Products This transmission route is particularly relevant to intravenous drug users, hemophiliacs, and recipients of blood transfusions and blood products. Sharing and reusing syringes contaminated with HIV-infected blood represents a major risk for infection with HIV. Needle sharing is the cause of one-third of all new HIV infections in North America, China, and Eastern Europe. The risk of being infected with HIV from a single prick with a needle that has been used on an HIV-infected person is thought to be about 1 in 50. Post-exposure prophylaxis with an anti-HIV drug can further reduce this risk. This route can also affect people who give and receive tattoos and piercings. Universal precautions are frequently not followed in both sub-Saharan Africa and much of Asia because of both a shortage of supplies and inadequate training. The WHO estimates that approximately 2.5% of all HIV infections in sub-Saharan Africa are transmitted through unsafe healthcare injections. Because of this, the United Nations General Assembly has urged the nations of the world to implement precautions to prevent HIV transmission by health workers. The risk of transmitting HIV to blood transfusion recipients is extremely low in developed countries where improved donor selection and HIV screening is performed. However, according to the WHO, the overwhelming majority of the world's population does not have access to safe blood and between 5 and 10% of the world's HIV infections come from transfusions of infected blood and blood products. Section 2.3 Perinatal Transmission The transmission of the virus from the mother to the child can occur in utero during the last weeks of pregnancy and at childbirth. In the absence of treatment, the transmission rate between a mother and her child during pregnancy, labor, and delivery is 25%. However, when the mother takes antiretroviral therapy and gives birth by caesarean section, the rate of transmission is just 1%. The risk of infection is influenced by the viral load of the mother at birth. With the higher the viral load, the higher the risk. Breastfeeding also increases the risk of transmission by about 4%. Section 3 Pathophysiology The pathophysiology of AIDS is complex, as is the case with all syndromes. Ultimately, HIV causes AIDS by depleting CD4 plus T helper lymphocytes. This weakens the immune system and allows opportunistic infections. T lymphocytes are essential to the immune response, and without them, the body cannot fight infections or kill cancerous cells. The mechanism of CD4 plus T cell depletion differs in the acute and chronic phases. During the acute phase, HIV-induced cell lysis and killing of infected cells by cytotoxic T cells 
accounts for CD4 plus T cell depletion, although apoptosis may also be a factor. During the chronic phase, the consequences of generalized immune activation, coupled with the gradual loss of the ability of the immune system to generate new T cells, appears to account for the slow decline in CD4 plus T cell numbers. Although the symptoms of immune deficiency characteristic of AIDS do not appear for years after a person is infected, the bulk of CD4 plus T cell loss occurs during the first weeks of infection, especially in the intestinal mucosa, which harbors the majority of lymphocytes found in the body. The reason for the preferential loss of mucosal CD4 plus T cells is that a majority of mucosal CD4 plus T cells express the CCR5 co-receptor, whereas a small fraction of CD4 plus T cells in the bloodstream do so. HIV seeks out and destroys CCR5 expressing CD4 plus cells during acute infection. A vigorous immune response eventually controls the infection and initiates the clinically latent phase. However, CD4 plus T cells in mucosal tissues remain depleted throughout the infection, although enough remain to initially ward off life-threatening infections. Continuous HIV replication results in a state of generalized immune activation persisting throughout the chronic phase. Immune activation, which is reflected by the increased activation state of immune cells and release of pro-inflammatory cytokines, results from the activity of several HIV gene products and the immune response to ongoing HIV replication. Another cause is the breakdown of the immune surveillance system of the mucosal barrier caused by the depletion of mucosal CD4 plus T cells during the acute phase of the disease. This results in the systematic exposure of the immune system to microbial components of the gut's normal flora which in a healthy person is kept in check by the mucosal immune system. The activation and proliferation of T cells that results from immune activation provides fresh targets for HIV infection. However, direct killing by HIV alone cannot account for the observed depletion of CD4 plus T cells, since only 0.01 to 0.1 percent of CD4 plus T cells in the blood are infected. A major cause of CD4 plus T cell loss appears to result from their heightened susceptibility to apoptosis when the immune system remains activated. Although new T cells are continuously produced by the thymus to replace the lost ones, the regenerative capacity of the thymus is slowly destroyed by direct infection of its thymocytes by HIV. Eventually, the minimal number of CD4 plus T cells necessary to maintain a sufficient immune response is lost, leading to AIDS. Cells affected The virus, entering through whichever route, acts primarily on the following cells. CD4 plus T helper cells Macrophages Monocytes B lymphocytes certain endothelial cells, microglia of the nervous system, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, neurons indirectly by the action of cytokines, and the GP120. The effect. The virus has cytopathic effects, but how it does is still not quite clear. It can remain inactive in these cells for long periods, though. This effect is hypothesized to be due to the CD4-GP120 interaction. The most prominent effect of HIV is its T-helper cell suppression and lysis. The cell is simply killed off or deranged to the point of being functionless. They do not respond to foreign antigens. The infected B cells cannot produce enough antibodies either. Thus the immune system collapses, leading to the familiar AIDS complication, like infections and neoplasms. Infection of the cells of the CNS cause acute aseptic meningitis, subacute encephalitis, vacular myelopathy, and peripheral neuropathy. Later it leads to even AIDS dementia complex. The CD4-GP120 interaction 
is also permissive to other viruses like cytomegalovirus, hepatitis virus, herpes simplex virus, etc. These viruses lead to further cell damage, i.e. cytopathy. Section 5. Prevention The three main transmission routes of HIV are sexual contact, exposure to infected bodily fluids or tissues, and from mother to fetus or child during the perinatal period. It is possible to find HIV in the saliva, tears, and urine of infected individuals, but there are no recorded cases of infection by these secretions, and the risk of infection is negligible. Antiretroviral treatment of infected patients also significantly reduces their ability to transmit HIV to others by reducing the amount of virus in their bodily fluids to undetectable levels. Section 5.1, Sexual Contact. The majority of HIV infections are acquired through unprotected sexual relations between partners, one of whom has HIV. The primary mode of HIV infection worldwide is through sexual contact between members of the opposite sex. During a sexual act, only male or female condoms can reduce the risk of infection with HIV and other STDs. The best evidence to date indicates that typical condom use reduces the risk of heterosexual HIV transmission by approximately 80% over the long term, though the benefit is likely to be higher if condoms are used correctly on every occasion. The male latex condom, if used correctly without oil-based lubricants, is the single most effective available technology to reduce the sexual transmission of HIV and other sexually transmitted infections. Manufacturers recommend that oil-based lubricants such as petroleum jelly, butter, and lard not be used with latex condoms because they dissolve the latex, making the condoms porous. If lubrication is desired, manufacturers recommend using water-based lubricants. Oil-based lubricants can be used with polyurethane condoms. Female condoms are commonly made from polyurethane, but are also made from nitrile and latex. They are larger than male condoms and have a stiffened ring-shaped opening with an inner ring designed to be inserted into the vagina, keeping the condom in place. Inserting the female condom requires squeezing this ring. Female condoms have been shown to be an important HIV prevention strategy by preliminary studies, which suggests that the overall protected sexual acts increase relative to unprotected sexual acts where female condoms are available. At present, availability of female condoms is very low and the price remains prohibitive for many women. Studies on couples where one partner is infected show that with consistent condom use, HIV infection rates for the uninfected partner are below 1% per year. Prevention strategies are well known in developed countries, but epidemiological and behavioral studies in Europe and North America suggest that a substantial minority of young people continue to engage in high-risk practices despite HIV-AIDS knowledge, underestimating their own risk of becoming infected with HIV. Randomized controlled trials have shown that male circumcision lowers the risk of HIV infection among heterosexual men by up to 60%. It is expected that this procedure will be actively promoted in many of the countries affected by HIV, although doing so will involve confronting a number of practical, cultural, and attitudinal issues. However, programs to encourage condom use, including providing them free to those in poverty, are estimated to be 95 times more cost-effective than circumcision at reducing the rate of HIV in Sub-Saharan Africa. Some experts fear that a lower perception of vulnerability among circumcised men may result in more sexual risk-taking behavior, thus negating its preventative effects. However, one randomized controlled trial indicated that adult male circumcision was not associated with increased HIV risk behavior. Studies of HIV infection rates among women who have undergone female genital cutting have reported mixed results. For details, see Female Genital Cutting. A three-year study in South Africa, completed in 2010, found that antimicrobial vaginal gel could reduce infection rates among women by 50% after one year of use, and by 39% after two and a half years. The results of the study, which was conducted by the Center for the AIDS Program of Research in South Africa, or CAPRISA, were published in Science Magazine in July 2010, and were then presented at an international AIDS conference in Vienna. Section 6.3 body fluid exposure. Healthcare workers can reduce exposure to HIV by employing precautions to reduce the risk of exposure to contaminated blood. 
These precautions include barriers such as gloves, masks, protective eyewear or shields, and gowns or aprons which prevent exposure of the skin or mucous membranes to bloodborne pathogens. Frequent and thorough washing of the skin immediately after being contaminated with blood or other bodily fluids can reduce the chance of infection. Finally, sharp objects like needles, scalpels, and glass are carefully disposed of to prevent needle stick injuries with contaminated items. Since intravenous drug use is an important factor in HIV transmission in developed countries, harm reduction strategies such as needle exchange programs are used in attempts to reduce the infections caused by drug abuse. Section 5.3 Mother to Child Current recommendations state that when replacement feeding, as with a wet nurse, is acceptable, feasible, affordable, sustainable, and safe, HIV-infected mothers should avoid breastfeeding their infant. However, if this is not the case, exclusive breastfeeding is recommended during the first months of life and should be discontinued as soon as possible. Section 5.4 Education One way to change risky behavior is through health education. Several studies have shown the positive impact of education and health literacy on cautious sex behavior. Education works only if it leads to higher health literacy and general cognitive ability. This ability is relevant to understanding the relationship between one's own risky behavior and possible outcomes like HIV transmission. In July 2010, a UN AIDS interagency task team on education commissioned literature review found there was a need for more research into non-African, especially non-South African, contexts. More research on the actual implementation of sex education programs, such as teacher training, access to related services through schools and the community, or parental attitudes to HIV and AIDS education, and more longitudinal studies on the deeper complexities of the relationship between education and HIV. History and Origin See also the main article, Origin of AIDS. AIDS was first reported June 5, 1981, when the U.S. Centers for Disease Control, CDC, recorded a cluster of pneumocystis carinii pneumonia, now still classified as PCP, but known to be caused by pneumocystis urovetsi, in five homosexual men in Los Angeles. In the beginning, the CDC did not have an official name for the disease, often referring to it by way of the diseases that were associated with it. For example, lymphadenopathy, the disease after which the discoverers of HIV originally named the virus. They also used Kaposi's sarcoma and opportunistic infections, the name by which a task force had been set up in 1981. In the general press, the term GRID, which stood for Gay-Related Immune Deficiency, had been coined. The CDC, in search of a name, and looking at the infected communities, coined the 4-H disease, as it seemed to single out Haitians, homosexuals, hemophiliacs, and heroin users. However, after determining that AIDS was not isolated to the gay community, the term GRID became misleading and AIDS was introduced at a meeting in July 1982. By September 1982, the CDC started using the name AIDS and properly defined the illness. The earliest known positive identification of the HIV-1 virus comes from the Congo in 1959 and 1960, though genetic studies indicate that it passed into the human population from chimpanzees around 50 years earlier. A recent study states that a strain of HIV-1 probably moved from Africa to Haiti and then entered the United States around 1969. The HIV virus descends from the related simian immunodeficiency virus, or SIV, which infects apes and monkeys in Africa. There is evidence that humans who participate in bushmeat activities, either as hunters or as bushmeat vendors, commonly acquire SIV. However, only a few of these infections were able to cause epidemics in humans, and all did so in the late 19th to early 20th centuries. 
To explain why HIV became epidemic only by that time, there are several theories, each invoking specific driving factors that may have promoted SIV adaptation to humans, or initial spread, social changes following colonialism, rapid transmission of SIV through unsafe or unsterile injections, that is, injections in which the needle is reused without being sterilized, colonial abuses and unsafe smallpox vaccinations or injections, or prostitution and the concomitant high frequency of genital ulcer diseases, such as syphilis, in nascent colonial cities. See the main article, Origin of AIDS. One of the first high-profile victims of AIDS was the American actor Rock Hudson, a known homosexual who had been married and divorced earlier in life, who died on 2 October 1985, having announced that he was suffering from the virus on 25 July that year. It had been diagnosed during 1984. A notable British casualty of AIDS that year was Nicholas Eden, a member of Parliament and son of the late Prime Minister Anthony Eden. Eden Jr., a lifelong bachelor, was also a known homosexual. The virus claimed perhaps its most famous victim yet on 24 November 1991, when British rock star Freddie Mercury, lead singer of the band Queen, died from an AIDS-related illness, having only announced that he was suffering from the disease the previous day. However, he had been diagnosed as HIV-positive during 1987. One of the first high-profile heterosexual victims of the virus was Arthur Ashe, the American tennis player. He was diagnosed as HIV-positive on 31 August 1988 having contracted the virus from blood transfusions during heart surgery earlier in the 1980s. Further tests within 24 hours of the initial diagnosis revealed that Ash had AIDS, but he did not tell the public about his diagnosis until April 1992. He died, aged 49, as a result of the AIDS virus on 6 February 1993. A more controversial theory, known as the OPV-AIDS hypothesis, suggests that the AIDS epidemic was inadvertently started in the late 1950s in the Belgian Congo by Hilary Kaprowski's research into a poliomyelitis vaccine. According to scientific consensus, this scenario is not supported by the available evidence.